Hello, good afternoon and welcome. Welcome to this event on delivering the 2021-2027 MFF and Next Generation EU, how to match strategy, resources and expectations. My name is Etienne Basso and I'm director at the Members Research Service at the EPRS. This is the second event on the MFF. The first was uh, held on the 14th of April together with uh, President Sassoli and with the chair of the Conference of Committee Chairs, um, Antonio Tajani, and it focused on the complex negotiations that led to an agreement on the MFF and Next Generation EU in July last year. We have the privilege to have with us today Mr. Johan van Overfeld, who is the chair of the Parliament's Committee on Budgets and one of the Parliament's key figures in the long and difficult process of negotiating the MFF. After served, uh, having served as a federal finance minister in the Belgian government at the 2019 European election, he was elected as a member of the European Parliament besides Budget Chair Mr. Van Overfeld is also member of the Econ Committee. He has brought a wealth of business and political experience straight into one of the key processes the EP has been involved since the start of the legislature, negotiating the long-term budget or the MFF in a challenging context. As uh, the Parliament Chief Negotiator, Mr. Van Overfeld led the Parliament's NEGO team for the next long-term EU budget and own resource reform. And the other members of the team were Mr. Jan Olbricht, Margarita Marquez, Jose Manuel Fernandez, Valerie Ayer, and Rasmus Andresen. The Parliament has been a strong advocate of a robust MFF and reform of the own resource system. It welcomed the creation of a recovery instrument to kickstart the economy, but criticized some aspects of the political agreement of, on the MFF, in particular cuts to programs which are crucial in investing in a better, fairer and greener future for Europeans. After intensive work and determination, Parliament's negotiators managed to achieve a number of EP key demands, including reinforcements of several flagships program and increased flexibility. The result, we have now an historical multi-annual financial framework agreement, the biggest financial package in EU history, a total of 1.8 trillion. So um, uh, we have now a distinguished panel. I would like to welcome all experts that are with us around this table that will be later on led by um, Fabia Jones, our colleague, but before that, I would like to invite Mr. Van Overtveld to share with us his opening remarks. Over to you, Mr. Van Overtveld. Thank you, um, Monsieur Basso, for these uh, introductory comments. <clears throat> Thank you for having me here, and I think it's, uh, it's well-timed to have this kind of reflection on uh, the MFF, post factum, as they say, but also certainly on the NGEU, and the RRF, which are, of course, uh, of huge importance uh, for what uh, lies ahead. Um, in terms of my introductory remarks, let me start with the observation that it would, of course, be desirable to have a stringent syst uh, systematic alignment between what is the title of this uh, conference, the strategy, resources and expectations. And in principle, of course, uh, the MFF negotiations should be a, a key or maybe the key occasion uh, for the EU institutions to improve the coherence of political and budgetary policy and to make sure <clears throat> that the EU uses uh, its budget in the most optimal way in areas with the highest uh, added value uh, for its citizen. However, however, uh, and of course, uh, regrettable to a certain extent, it often works uh, within the EU a little bit the other way around, where we have to adjust uh, strategies and policy preferences to the ceilings and the budget constraints that are imposed. Uh, and this is not just in overall uh, amounts, but also in uh, how the amounts are divided upon, uh, amongst the different areas uh, I'll come back to that uh, uh, in a minute. Now, 
I think it's uh, not hard uh, to notice uh, that there is in this context what I always label as a kind of consistent inconsistency uh, on the part of the Council. Um, launching ambitious plans and intentions without foreseeing the necessary means to bring them uh, to fulfillment and to bring them into uh, success is of course a counterproductive strategy that backfires or that uh, tends to backfire uh, in terms of how citizens see and appreciate uh, these uh, initiatives. I think uh, we have to put, um, and certainly the Council, if you allow me to say it like that, uh, we have to put uh, our money where our mouth is, and if we don't have the money, maybe we should once in a while just shut up uh, instead of talking loudly. Um, now, if, this, if the Council decides to leave the overall amount of the EMF basically unchanged, which is more or less what happened also with the new MFF, then of course, I think a serious rethink of the directions in which the money flows <clears throat> would be uh, much in order. We still, like I said, focus, uh, and like all of you of course know, uh, very heavily on cohesion funds and agricultural uh, support. And while we are doing that, the United States and China are racing full speed into the technologies of the future. Europe is certainly into the game. We are not absent into this race, but reality obliges me to say we are lagging. There was a very interesting article in the Financial Times a few days ago where they made uh, a top 20 of the most valuable, by market capitalization, uh, 20 most valuable high-tech companies. Um, three of the 20 are European companies. Three. Twelve of them are American companies. If you look at the venture capital market, which is, of course, very important for the... Uh, uh, development of new business, of uh, research intensive business, of technologically uh, important business, um, then you see that the, the venture capital market, the resources available in the venture capital market in the United States are triple, triple the amount available in all the EU member states combined. These are differences that we really should uh, do something about, a reorientation of the budget towards uh, future technology and R&D uh, is really imperative and uh, like um, was said in the introduction, at, during the MFF negotiations we have been consistently arguing in that direction with some result, but I really would have uh, hoped for more maybe uh, next time. Now I come to the NGEU uh, and, of, and more specifically the, the main part of it, which is the uh, R, uh, RRF, the Recovery and Resilience uh, Facility. Um, and here we should and could uh, and can be more positive on how strategy, uh, resources and expectations have been matched. But a lot of ground still has to be covered to make it into a really a success. And by the way, we really need this success. Not only because uh, we can expect uh, a prolonged uh, period of economic difficulties following uh, the, 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 the enormous impact the corona pandemic and the measures needed to contain it have produced, but also because um, the EU um, let's say, did not really perform very well during uh, this uh, uh, pandemic. And um, I think certainly with respect to the vaccination campaign, uh, this really has to be admitted. I find it still outrageous that uh, the, the EU is running so much behind the UK and the US in terms of that vaccination program. And uh, a lot has been said already uh, about that, but I think in terms of the way in which the negotiations were done with the pharmaceutical companies, and I'm not uh, saying that they don't have any blame, far from it, 
but really important mistakes were made. We have to deliver on the uh, recovery and resilience zone, and we better make sure that we deliver big time. National plans have to be thoroughly scrutinized to make sure that we get optimal returns for our citizens on the amounts uh, invested. And I want to draw the attention here to a point that is of special interest for me, and I hope for all of you, and that is that we make sure that we avoid fraudulent use of money in the context of this RRF. We all know, there are clear indications of it, that uh, all kinds of groups, criminal groups, also from outside the EU, are lining up together to get, let's say, a finger into the pie. And it would be really outrageous for all of us who bear responsibility within the EU institutions if we let that happen. Again, the major responsibility uh, rests with the Commission. And I'm very happy, I was very happy to read recent declarations of uh, Vice President uh, Valdis Dombrovskis who seem to be very aware of this situation and who seems to be very motivated to uh, manage this in the best way uh, possible. He can be assured uh, that he'll find certainly me, but the whole European Parliament on his side in the fight to make this RRF into a success that the EU and its citizens at this point in time need very much. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Van Overtveld, for uh, sharing your thoughts uh, about the previous negotiations and the challenges in the implementation and being so frank also in, 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 in doing so. I would like just to, 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 to ask you one, one question. Um, what do you think how the, how the EU will make sure that the budget is, is well spent and goes where the needs are? Uh, this is a point that you touched, but what should we do to, to make sure that the, the money goes where, where the needs are? In the implementation? Well, I think there should be, uh, first of all, there is a big responsibility with the national entities, of course, that they make sure that their national plans are in accordance with what are the major needs of their economies in the slipstream of the corona pandemic. I, we cannot deny that there is a huge national responsibility, but of course, there rests a responsibility with the European institutions, first of all with the European Commission, but not only the Commission, to make sure that when these plans are introduced, that they are in, in, in a correct and sensible way scrutinized so uh, as to get, like I said, the optimal return on the funds uh, invested. But it's a kind of uh, chain of responsibility. Uh, for example, in my own country, in Belgium, there have been intense discussion between uh, the regional uh, authorities and the federal level to make sure that the, the national plan that Belgium is uh, putting forward vis-a-vis uh, -vis Europe uh, is as the full support of those regional authorities and also the, the, the knowledge of the local situations that of course these regional authorities have very much placed into these plans and focused on into these plans. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Van der I, I don't see now any uh, other questions uh, coming up immediately. So I would like to ask uh, Fabia Jones, who is the head of our uh, budgetary policies unit uh, that has prepared this event, to to take over the moderation and to um, and to um, to introduce the uh, speakers. Please over to you, Fabia. Um, thank you, Etienne. And I would also like to thank Mr. Van Overtveld for sharing his thoughts with us. So really interesting and thought provoking. Um, on questions, um, I just want to remind the audience that they, questions can be introduced at any moment uh, via the Q&A function in the panel. On the right hand bottom of the screen, there are three dots, or through the chat. However you like, we will pick up your questions and we will ask them. Um, I will we will ask them at the end um, after after the panelists have had a chance to speak. So I will turn now immediately to the panel. Um, and it's a great pleasure for me to be introducing this roundtable discussion with a panel of EU budget experts who will look in 
detail of various aspects of the 2021-27 uh, MFF and NGU package, uh, what it will deliver, and the extent to which the, the package agreed last December matches the, the, the challenges, the policy challenges facing us and citizens' expectations. We'll start with um, our first expert is Hannah Jans. I'm delighted to welcome Hannah. She is Deputy Head of Cabinet of Johannes Hahn, who is the European Commissioner for Budget and Administration. Um, Hannah is responsible within his Cabinet for alignment of the EU budget with policy objectives. So she's the ideal person to kick off this discussion on delivering the 2021-27 um, MFF and NGU and on how to match strategy, resources and expectations. Now, most commentators would agree that the, 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 the package agreed last December was unprecedented, but does it respond to the challenges currently facing the EU? Hannah, please give us your views on how the EU financing package agreed in December 2020 matches strategy, resources and citizens' expectation. Thank you. Uh, many thanks, Fabia, and uh, many thanks also to Mr. Van Overfeld for his inspiring words indeed, uh, which I will try already uh, to feed into my short intervention. I don't know whether I will be able to answer the, the very question of today's event. I, I suppose that we will have to wait a little bit uh, uh, to see whether the expectations indeed have been matched uh, with the strategy and resources, because as already indicated by uh, Mr. Van Overveld, many things are yet to be in place. And as we speak, we are uh, negotiating a lot of files still, policy files that will have an impact indeed on how the the, the policy side of the of the of uh, what we want to finance will look like. But let me uh, maybe start because I think it's important to send uh, set a, a scene uh, properly uh, with the following. Um, we, uh, as you all know, in 2018, put a package on the table that uh, had a long wait and discussion uh, phase um, between the Council and the Parliament. And, and with a failure in February 2020 of the, uh, of the European Council, we were uh, heading into the crisis uh, that hit the, the whole uh, Europe, but obviously also the world. And already now we know that in 2020, the GDP suffered of dramatic con uh, contraction of 6.3%. And this was to a certain extent estimated by the um, analysis and estimates that we have done. But I what I want to say, and want to, want to underline that for this particular moment in time, we actually were, I think, uh, going into the right order of having a strategy ahead of the money, because we were at the end of the day proposing a new budget um, or revamped MFF with NGU, uh, as you say, um, unprecedented proposal in 2020 in order to really match the challenges and, uh, and to still maybe see whether we can stick to the strategy and the priorities of that, um, of that commission. Um, that were at the end of the day uh, um, approved also by the two um, budget, uh, uh, budgetary authorities. So what we have seen in March, and I think that um, I can say that I was actually privileged to be witnessing of, of all this work that was internally done to actually really match the needs, is um, is uh, the package of 28th of May, and I may ask now to put the first slide on, which stayed very much focused on green digital, as we all know, but had uh, an additional implication because we need, we did, we did look into the, into the money that we have, uh, the programs that we have from different perspectives. That's something that you all know. Let us then stay a little bit and tell um, what indeed on slide two, please, um, happens with money. So the resources, of course, for the first time, more than 32% uh, of the money is spent on new and reinforced priorities. This is an achievement that, um, that I think we managed to keep uh, during the negotiations. Um, and of course, important to deliver uh, 
von der Leyen Commission Priorities. Uh, Horizon, um, CEF, Invest, you, you name it. All the programs are still there, but they were, um, if you like, looked at uh, from a different perspective, from the perspective of a, a union that is in crisis, union that has a lot of challenges that are old or new, and union that needs to uh, build the resilience up that is very much needed uh, for future years to come. Uh, next slide, please. This was matched, of course, with well-known policies. For some, they are old-fashioned and um, well-known, if I may say. For some, they are modernized and up to the challenge. And I am, uh, I am part of those, or, uh, part of this uh, uh, latter group. I believe, uh, well, common agricultural policy is still being negotiated in terms of the regulations, but I, I believe that cohesion policy, wherever we could, we could already refocus uh, and in the negotiations with the um, Council and the Parliament, this is really seen, that we are uh, moderate, modernizing the policy, that we are fitting it for purpose of re, uh, uh, resilience building and recovery. Um, next slide, please. And the final uh, and the fa uh, famous, sorry, uh, next generation EU part, which was indeed very unprecedented, uh, package based on Article 1 to 2 of the treaty, which was devised uh, to show solidarity and uh, in critical moments. And we were in such a moment. We had uh, spent uh, most of March and April um, to actually um, try in the Commission to tailor make uh, this particular part of the proposal and to make sure that it flies. We knew that we have only one shot because we were already very much delayed, as you know, with MFF, that this is the only opportunity and we needed to make this right. So this proposal was, um, was actually uh, being conceived, if I may say, under a lot of uh, pressure from that particular angle. But of course, as you see here, uh, um, as you see here, we did focus on on priorities um, that are uh, long term um, and that needed to be um, revamped because of the crisis. The NGU alone is expected to boost a GDP growth with estimates ranging from one to three percent and supporting around 2 million of jobs in the three years um, that we will have to commit the money and then in the next three years we will implement. More than 50%, as you can see from that slide, will, will support modernization and of course include, uh, as I said, research, innovation, digital preparedness, um, but as well top up existing programs. Next slide, please. I believe that, as I said in the beginning, what we have proposed and uh, what was then agreed is, is a solid basis to match the strategy with resources. And, and actually, uh, you know, uh, most of people say that crisis give, give, um, uh, uh, gives or gave Europe a wake up or, or, or a, an alarm um, to, to look at things, at different programs from that perspective. Uh, with numerous programs that I have listed on this slide, um, as well as, of course, the cohesion and, and, and CEP, I think we are going to uh, get there eventually. The question is, of course, the timeline and um, whether the expectations and uh, global uh, scenery will uh, will make us um, deliver uh, what we want. So, on the question uh, whether we have managed the, uh, the the expectations or to meet the expectations, I think with the proposal, yes, as such, I think that Europe needed something that is different. Um, our stakeholders, uh, citizens, businesses, you name it, they needed something that will show them that we are looking at things differently. So in that context, I think the proposal was meeting the expectations. But on the implementation side or on the results side, of course, it's too early to tell from several reasons. 
Um, what we proposed, of course, in the Commission that time was uh, to a certain extent then modified and that the beauty of negotiations by the Council and the Parliament. We had, uh, as you may recall, um, proposed a certain part of the money to be focused on um, first year of recovery, uh, to react better to the situations that are on the ground, to help the, the, the businesses with solvency instruments and, and a more focused open, uh, um, more, more, more focused strategic agenda. This, however, did not survive to the, to the extent that we would have wished. But the rest of the things did survive, and there is a lot of recollection or, uh, and appreciation of what survived through the negotiations. What is still not there, of course, is um, the sectoral uh, programs um, um, that we have not yet fully um, um, negotiated. The legal basis for around uh, uh, 30 sectoral regulations are not yet there, which of course delays the implementation and then hence also the expectations uh, from those who are counting on us are of course not matched. Only 12 regulations, the sectoral ones, have been adopted. Uh, we will also, of course, to run the show on the NGU, uh, need ORD ratifications, and uh, you all follow uh, very closely, I'm sure, um, um, the situation. We have still eight countries that haven't ratified um, the ORD decision that is needed uh, to start borrowing and to really uh, uh, deliver resources uh, to the, especially RRF plans, which, of course, are going to consume 90% of the uh, NGU um, uh, funding. We still are going to negotiate cohesion uh, policy programs, rural development plans. We still will uh, need to have uh, funding strategies for different programs that you see on that slide. We are delayed in, in terms of implementation, there is no doubt, and maybe yet not fully, of course, uh, from that perspective uh, as well, uh, delivered on expectations. But in conclusion, I would like to show you um, an example or showcase of uh, actually how budget and resources and EU policies can, um, can contribute to deliver expectations. And let me turn to 2020 because I think it's a good um, showcase for us to discuss later on in terms of what are the future plans. Um, can I have the next slide, please? And the next one. Thank you. I want to talk about COVID response because it's, an, it's a unique uh, opportunity to show to you how many different areas of our um, um, uh, um, uh, prerogatives have uh, been matched together to help uh, both economic but also uh, policy response. Of course, the recovery plan for Europe was one of the elements uh, that you can see on the, on the, on, on the right uh, uh, corner of the, or, of, of the diagram. The money, the money that, is, that has been provided, that has been negotiated, of course, was already, already a relief for the, for the citizens and for the economy. But then we have also used as an economic response to the crisis a lot of flexibilities that was left uh, for MFF 2020 to the extent uh, that is possible. I think that I have uh, um, never seen the budget uh, exhausted to such an extent, the annual budget, as I have seen in 2020. And we have used every single possibility to make sure that we can still squeeze out um, in the last year of MFF what we can to support um, uh, citizens and uh, economy in fighting the crisis. Uh, one of the important initiatives was the Corona Response Investment Initiative uh, with around 18 billion uh, in investment as it stands now, which was th that time uh, when the crisis hit the unspent cohesion funds, which uh, with, with which we have um, uh, supported um, the suffering economies. And here also with the help to change a little bit and extend the scope of the, of the cohesion funds into health and uh, tourism related and SMEs related measures. And this is also an unprecedented situation where the two co-legislators agree in three weeks 
on the Commission regulatory proposal. State aid rules, one should not forget about them. We have uh, provided additional liquidity to economy supported business and jobs. Then, of course, the SURE program that was uh, the, uh, but I think is the, the, um, the prelude or the, the, the entry into the big borrowing business that, uh, that we are going to, the, to be doing uh, under the next generation EU. SURE program is, um, is supporting, um, uh, is, 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 support, is, is a support targeted especially to the unemployed that, uh, that lost jobs during the crisis. And we have already provided more than 75 billion of loans and the last tranche is going to be delivered to member states who ask for it. And we have 19 member states um, still in May. And then, of course, additional measures uh, of member states that one should not forget that have uh, been provided to support um, um, uh, their economies, um, also in terms of uh, emergency programs, but also fiscal uh, uh, shrinking fiscal space to make it more uh, um, flexible to the needs of the economy. And the last slide, please. Almost last. So the, these are the these are the amounts that were used so far for or in 2020 rather I should say for the COVID related measures and this shows you how flexible and how um, um, policy targeted uh, we can be um, and that budget is actually the the best tool uh, or the EU budget the best tool that can be combined with the national measures to support crisis. Um, and the final slide on the, of course, policy response, which has to be matched with the, with the money. The final slide, please. Mm. Yes, thank you. So in the, when we were mobilizing our resources and when, when we were uh, supporting member states with relaxation of fiscal rules and state aid, we also have provided um, several elements of the of the health and emergency response under the policy support, as you can see on this slide, which of course matched um, matched the funding. Uh, I think this is a very good example to start uh, of the discussion for the next uh, step, meaning how indeed different priorities uh, can be uh, matched uh, with the resources provided. And I'm not talking here only about the crisis or post-crisis measures, of, uh, of course, and how we can uh, make sure that we meet the expectations uh, that, uh, that are still there, no doubt. Thank you very much. Many thanks, Hannah, for this detailed um, overview and, and outlook. And I fully agree with, with your point um, on, on the need to look at how the resources and, and, and different policy priorities match. And indeed, we will look in detail at a number of those as we go through this panel. I would like now to turn to our second panelist, uh, Jorge Nunez Ferrer, who is a senior research fellow at the Centre for European Policy Studies. SEPs. So Jorge has many years experience working on EU budgetary and financial instruments, among other things. If you want to see a bit more about these other things, have a look at his biography. Um, and he's currently leading the SEPs Recovery and Resilience Reflection Project Initiative. And his work on this has indeed been mentioned, picked up by the, by the Financial Times, Politico and other national newspapers. He will, um, we will send you some details of that through the chat shortly. Um, in his talk today, um, Jorge is going to focus on the key challenges um, on the implementation of the recovery package. So Jorge, we know that there are a number of preconditions remaining to be met before the re recovery plan can be launched. Hannah mentioned them, for example, uh, ratification of the own resources decision. But once these conditions have been met and the recovery plan has launched, what are the key things we should watch out for during the implementation phase? And what, according to you, are the most important conditions that need to be met to help deliver a successful recovery? The floor is yours, Jorge. 
Thank you. Thank you to have me here. I'm going to try to be very, very concise because you can speak for three hours on that if I'm not careful. But let's go to the most important points. I mean, we are under a lot of pressure to deliver. You know, this is, it was supposed to be an emergency uh, support, with, but it's no longer so. And also there are other uh, measures that exist uh, nationally. It was very useful to have the the uh, next generation EU uh, also to calm the markets, which is one of the things that happen, and therefore give a little bit of breathing space, uh, space. It doesn't mean that the funding was put into function. Um, but it is not anymore really an emergency fund, uh, and it's not focused solely on the impacts of COVID as it was in, uh, originally described. Uh, it is more a resilience and redirection uh, fund now, and correctly so. Um, and really on the redirection, what is very important, I think it's not emphasized enough, and it has to be a key on that, is the restructuring function of this uh, funding, restructuring really on creating uh, a systemic change in the way uh, really the economies work. Um, and this is, does not mean to finance uh, projects on digital and, and green and it's really about the uh, functioning of of the economic systems because some of the countries have been uh, have not been able to recover from the previous crisis. So this is actually a support for, let's say, both crises, the lingering effect of the previous one and this one. One of the important things uh, that that we have with the next generation, you uh, the important factors that we have to be careful about is its additionality and its function and i have to say in that we have to be very careful because it has to align and supplement other funding and the mff uh, and i find that there has been there is a little bit of a demarcation missing also in the way the uh, recovery uh, package is being seen uh, it just covers everything like the mff uh, and uh, therefore, I think the, the function of it has been a bit uh, overwhelmed by demands in every direction for it to do uh, all kinds of, uh, of things. Uh, so we have loaded the uh, Recovery and Resilience Facility with every possible wish um, and not really differentiating, uh, differentiated the scope. What are the key focus points that I would consider uh, crucial? Uh, first is to uh, to make sure that the recovery, how it's being used, uh, is to uh, target the impacts in a changing environment. We have an asymmetric uh, recovery process. We don't have a symmetric one. The economy will recover with different speed and different sections. And we have to be quite surgical in the way uh, funding is going to be done to counteract uh, the, uh, the areas where it is uh, going to have a longer term effect rather than few, some areas that are actually going to pick up very quickly. Uh, for that, there is a paper, by the way, for the ITRE uh, committee that was done with uh, ECORIS on the different impacts in different sectors of the economy. Uh, this to get, uh, yeah. So the other uh, is uh, really a, a check the structural reform part of it. The structural reforms are key in several of the countries of their, uh, for this recovery. And they should be, uh, in reality, what is really the key for uh, the recovery and resilience facility is to use it as a way to compensate for the difficulties in the structural reforms. And I think that should be a focus more than the percent, exact percentages uh, of spending where it goes. It is do the countries that need structural reform, will they use it to uh, really bring the political support up to the level to be able to put quite difficult structural reforms through to handle the future economic challenges? So now the, I would just put three points, uh, four points, sorry, that are I think are essential uh, for the focus for the commission also to look at it and to keep uh, really the attention uh, in the right places. Uh, first of all, is the building a good framework for a very dynamic and changing economy that is coming in the future. Uh, this, uh, and of course, 
the asymmetric recovery process that's going to be very hard to be focusing on uh, uh, correctly. Uh, the other is to really the, to build, and these are the reforms part, the, to build uh, the, the social, educational, and state system, in addition to the hard underlying infrastructures. Uh, this means uh, labor market reforms, social policy reforms, education and skills transformation, to focus longer term. Uh, and not only to have programs and projects that could be eligible just to get the money spent. Uh, this is the next point, avoid to take projects that would have been in a normal maternal financial framework and try and get the RRF to finance it because it's a different uh, governance system and a different co-financing. It's not co-financing, in fact. This means that there would be a temptation to just get these projects done. And then you have a hole in the MFF that you have to fill with projects. And I wouldn't like this to be filled with worse projects or the commitments. So there is a question again, going back to this additionality point. And the final point that I think has been lost in the uh, next generation deal was the European dimension. We have renationalized practically everything is national, all the cross European financing parts were transformed into loans and we risk to have bubbles, national bubbles with very little programming on cross-border and the value change and the links in the single market. And we may have even uh, to be careful with the procurement process, not to be set up to support only national uh, companies for national projects with national views. We are having here a very high risk on a, uh, from the single market point of view, in my opinion. And that would be all. Thank you. Well, many thanks, uh, Jorge, for your, I would say, rather sobering comments. Um, but it's it, and it's great that you flag up these points so that obviously we need to to make sure that 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 not only do we have this recovery plan, but that it's it's delivered that it's delivered properly and that it delivers the kind of recovery that that that, that we need. So um, now I will turn to our second panelist, uh, Eulalia Rubio, who is a senior research fellow at the Jacques Delors Institute in Paris. Um, welcome, Eulalia. Um, Eulalia is a well-known expert in the field of, of EU budgetary affairs and the author of numerous publications on the EU budget, on EU budgetary policy, politics, policies and politics, and EU spending programs. So, Olalia, perhaps we could compare a bit how this, this unprecedented package uh, agreed in December compares to the previous MFF, and, and also if you, you could, you could uh, highlight the changes and how the current MFF aligns with strategy and expectations and I, and I think you're going to focus um, on on the industrial field and, and how that um, will contribute to this overall picture. Thank you Lelia. the floor is yours. Thank you Fabia, uh, thanks all. Uh, yeah indeed I wanted to have a look at well since the title is matching strategies and resources I would have a look at, uh, at the heading one of NFF or let's say all the EU spending related with uh, innovation, research, digital, which is going to, which, which is getting more and more important now and, and which has been also part of the discourses at EU level about, about this revamped EU industrial strategy that we are going to, to we are waiting for and it's going to be released uh, tomorrow, I think, but which has been already influencing a bit uh, the debates and the, and the actions of, at EU level since, since 2019 and even before. And the idea was to look at what has changed uh, with respect to previous MFF with this, this, uh, this group of EU spending program, pro programs focused on uh, innovation, research and digital, and to which extent the changes are aligned or go to the direction of this new thinking on the EU industrial strategy. So if we look at this heading one, uh, the heading one basically, I mean, there are some programs, but the most important one is, of course, Horizon Europe is more than half of the 50% of heading one MFF. Then we have also Invest EU Fund and we have also Connecting EU Facility, but the most important one really is, is Horizon Europe. 
Um, this having one had already been proposed to be improved uh, and, and extended by the Commission in, in 2018, when there was the first uh, proposal of uh, future MFF programs. But then with the crisis also, with the rebound of uh, MFF proposal, it was even further uh, increased the proposal of the Commission because we had this feeling that we needed to put more money there. Also with the help of, uh, of uh, Next Generation EU. Uh, if we look what has happened in the end, I mean, after all the negotiations, what has happened with this heading one, with the different programs we have inside, to be very brief, because I, we are not going to, I'm not going to review all the programs, but we can say that for Horizon Europe, we have a bit more money than we had in the previous MFF, but the increase is more modest than the one that the, the Commission proposed, even with the top ups and the, and the negotiation by the Parliament to increase a bit the, the program. Uh, for uh, there is a new program in this MFF which we didn't have in the la last MFF, which is a uh, digital Europe program, which is uh, particularly focused on supporting certain key digital technologies, the, the development and the deployment of key digital technologies such as cybersecurity, artificial intelligence, and high uh, computing. This program didn't exist, so, so we have uh, an increase in this sense, but this is much less than, than the Commission had proposed. The Commission proposed eight or nine billions and now we have six billions and then we have invest you fund and if we look at this probably i mean just living apart for, um, connecting your facility which haven't changed a lot it's more or less the same if we look at the outcome of the negotiation maybe the, the main big thing of the negotiation is invest you fund because actually with invest your fund really we have a decrease actually uh, the commission uh, proposed uh, uh, maintaining more or less the same money than uh, in the previous mff we have to remind them that in this EU fund replace uh, EPSI, replace the Juncker fund, but also replace other financial instruments that existed in the previous MFF. And if we merge all of them, the volume, uh, the volume allocated to the proposal of the Commission, the volume that the Commission proposed to allocate to this EU fund was more or less the same than the previous financial instruments plus EPSI. Then with the crisis, the Commission proposed to significant increase in the SEU fund and there was this proposal to go to, to 31 billion uh, thanks to uh, NGU and we have ended with something lower than uh, what we have now. We have now uh, an investment fund that is around eight or nine uh, billions whereas if we count all the all the financial instruments we had plus the Juncker fund we were at 15 billion. So that 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 probably is the, is the main big thing in terms of in quantitative terms. If we look qualitatively, because important is also to look what has happened qualitatively, and as I said, I wanted to look to which extent we are more aligned to this new thinking uh, in industrial strategies. But what I mean with this new thinking, of course, I am saying we don't know, we don't know yet the, the copy of the new revamp of the EU industrial strategy, but many of the ideas that are inside, and we know more or less that they will be uh, kept, were already present. They were present in the communication of 2019 from the Commission, and they were even present in the debate before. Uh, the ideas, the many ideas, we can summarize it in two or three. One was the need to have a, an industrial strategy less horizontal, like the classic industrial strategy we had in the previous decades, a more focused, more directional, more focused in certain areas, and particularly on the climate and the digital transition. The second idea was this more geopolitical dimension of the industrial strategy, the, the, the need to use industrial, the EU action in the industry to strengthen the strategic autonomy of the EU and particularly also the technological sovereignty of the EU. And the third idea related to these two ones is a new governance, uh, which is based very much on partnerships. We need to, we need to build partnerships with member states and with the private sector, because the EU alone cannot, cannot build this strategy. So the question is to which extent these new programs, apart from the quantitative changes, are more aligned to these ideas. If you look at them, uh, if you look, for instance, Horizon Europe, it's true that some of these ideas have been already integrated in the new Horizon Europe, if we compare it to the Horizon 2020. There is a bit more direction. There is this idea of missions that we have introduced that are have to orient a bit to EU action on research. We, we have defined five missions, uh, which are multidisciplinary and we uh, uh, which relate to big societal pro pro problems that we want to, 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 to address. But uh, it's true that the mission is only, only, I mean, it's only on the 
pillar two of Horizon Europe, and uh, they, they, they will not, they will not uh, influence all type of spending in Horizon Europe. They are supposed only to influence more or less ten percent of this pillar. So it's it's it's, a, it's, a, it's an improvement, but it's not uh, revolutionary in some sense. Then we have also the idea of partnerships. The partnerships have been improved, have been rationalized. There, in the past, uh, for a long time, there has been this use of partnerships in Horizon Europe. But there were many partnerships. The landscape of partnerships was very complex, and some of them were not very. There was not an intention. There was not a systematic analysis of the impact of these partnerships. And now the Commission has tried to rationalize these to put partnerships to, to to build partnerships bigger and more related with the strategic vision of of, of, of the challenges and the strategies of the of the. That that's also something good. And the third main novelty in Horizon Europe is this more focus on Brexit, uh, to innovation, disruptive innovations, and more focus also on the last stage of innovation. The idea that this is a typical, a typical uh, thing we always say that EU is very good in research and is very good in maybe the first steps of innovation, but then we fail in the scaling up of these innovations, in the introduction of these innovations in the market. And, this sense, and in this sense, we have the third pillar of Horizon Europe, which is a big novelty, which is this European Innovation Council, that, uh, that tries to focus very much on supporting breakthrough innovations, and also has a, uh, this accelerator that is a kind of mechanism that allows, that, that is very much focused on the latest stage of innovations and the introduction of the market. If we look at, at invest EU fund, um, it's also an improvement in this sense with respect to EPSI. EPSI was very much about mobilizing, mobilizing private investment. The, 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 the diagnostic was we are in, a, in the crisis. There has been a drop in private investment. We need to increase private investment, but uh, it was there was no not much policy steer actually. It was just giving a lot of um, you know impulse to the EIB to try to mobilize as much as possible investment with a with a quantitative target that we have. Now with Invest EU Fund, we see that there is a bit more uh, policy oriented. There are different windows, there are four windows for each for for different uh, domains, and the Commission has also a greater role in in in, in fixing the orientations of investment. But if we compare also to what was proposed by the Commission, you remember the Commission proposed a fifth window on strategic investment, which was supposed to fill a bit this idea or, or to, to respond a bit to this idea of the new industrial strategy to, to support key strategic value changes. These windows uh, disappear in the negotiation, and what we have now is just an indication in the EU invest, uh, in the invest EU regulation of uh, the fact that each window can support strategic investments. Uh, so this window has been a bit uh, integrated in the other windows, but in fact we don't have um, pre-allocation, we don't have earmarking. So it's a bit up to the partners that participate in invest EU fund to finance or not this type of strategic investments. There is a list of possible strategic investments, but there are no specific incentives to do more from this than that. And more importantly, maybe, as I said, the volume of Invest EU Fund has been, uh, decreased. And at the same time, we have lost this new instrument that was proposed by the Commission, the solvency support instrument that was supposed to support um, viable firms that are suffering, suffering during the, because of the crisis. And it is possible that because we don't have the solvency support instrument, the Invest EU Fund, and in general, the national and the, the national promotional banks and the EAB that are participating in Invest EU Fund are more, more forced and more, more, more pressure to, 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 comp uh, I mean, to cover this, this, these needs of, of supporting firms that are suffering, supporting firms that are viable but are suffering on the because of the crisis. So there will be maybe a pressure to put much more uh, money and to put much more effort to just providing you know, short-term relief uh, to, to firms down to invest in long-term strategic investment. So that there might be a sort of, you know, uh, we can see in you fund, um, yeah, much more on the short-term that we would like to have. And then we have um, Digital Europe program. Digital Europe program, from in my view, is the one that, let's say, responds more than, responds more to this vision, this new vision of EU industrial strategy, because it's very much about uh, scaling up uh, investments, it's a scaling up and deploying innovation. It's not about the first stages of innovation. It's really about helping innovative, uh, innovative technologies in digital to uh, spread and to be used and to and to deploy to be deployed. 
it focuses on very key strategic areas like cybersecurity, like artificial intelligence, which are known to be one of these strategic areas uh, that, uh, that are in the documents about the UN strategy. And it relies a lot on public partnerships with uh, the private sector and particularly with the members. So it's, it's really in this logic, the, the, the digital Europe uh, problem. The problem, or the, 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 not the problem, but the fact is that digital Europe uh, program is not very big actually, it's just uh, six, seven billions and it is distributed between these different uh, different um, areas and for instance for, for artificial intelligence or for cyber security, I think it's more or less two billions or 1.6. If you compare for instance with, uh, I was looking at what, what has been put in some member states recovery plans for these same areas, I mean, it's not very different. I mean, in some, in some, some member states put almost one billion or less or than one billion on cyber security or artificial intelligence. So at the EU level, we will not have a lot of funding compared to what it is at the national level. So uh, that, that's the, the landscape. So how, what, what's, just to summarize, what, how can, what would be my evaluation of to which extent this is aligned to this new EU industrial strategy and what can be done to make it more aligned. I would end up with just three points, three main conclusions maybe. The first is that if you look at the EU level, the EU level we don't have much money for anything. It's, it's, you know, the EU budget is always limited, it's not that we have a lot of money. But if we compare in terms of money, we have more money and we put more money on the research part and early uh, stages of innovation than on the deployment. We have very, very, very few money for the deployment part. Once, once the innovation has been created, how to introduce it into the market, how to help them uh, first grow up and commercialize this innovation and to deploy this innovation and scale up and deploy this innovation. And, um, and that's a problem. And we have seen it. I mean, the illustration of that is what has happened with vaccines, actually. Uh, the famous firm, Biotech, uh, received a lot of funding from the EU research program for more than 10 years, actually. It participated in in the EU research framework programs since 1998 until 2014. But then at the moment of scaling up, I mean, when, as, as Mr. Overwell has said, well, we have uh, in Europe a problem with venture capital market also, and it ended up being, uh, being commercialized in another, in another uh, country. So that's just an example, but it's true that we still have a lot of problems with this. We, we, we are very good in, in helping startups, but then we don't have a lot of funding to help them grow, grow up and to, to stay and to commercialize. So that's the first problem. The second problem is, as I have said, I mean, one of the ideas in the industrial strategy is we need more direction with our help or our support to innovation, uh, research and industry. Uh, now we have a bit more this directional approach also at the MFF, but the question is which direction we take. And what we see is different approaches to this. Because on the one hand, we have the mission approach, which is more problem solving approach. We have big problems with challenges and we try to articulate our spending and research to resolve these challenges and these problems. And on the other hand, we have the more industrial based approach of value changes, which is not exactly the same. And which is the one that is very much promoted now in the context of this EU industrial strategy, looking at ecosystem, uh, industrial ecosystems and looking at investment needs in these industrial ecosystems and focusing on the ones that for our uh, for us are more strategic to to strengthen or to maintain the, the strategic autonomy of you it's not exactly the same how to articulate this how to articulate the, you know the different directions and the third one is about uh, about the necessary need in industrial policy the necessary need to coordinate to align with the national level uh, industrial policy is costly and we don't have money at new level to do it alone. So we really need to work together with the national level. Now what we see now in the EU industrial strategy and what it seems to be the direction is to make use of a very powerful tool, which is this state aid tool. And uh, what we have seen in the last years is the use of this GIPSA, this important project of uh, common European interest, which is basically the use of a state aid by the EU Commission to allow member states to create uh, a, a network of projects on a single, on, 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 a, on a same uh, field and uh, through the relaxation of state aid to allow them to spend national funding to, to, to develop these projects. 
So the question, no, no, this, this question of it is going to be even more important because we had two of them and the battery, the one on batteries has worked quite well. And now we are going to build up, uh, or they are going to build up a new, a new one on hydrogen. And we see this, this tendency of uh, using the money from recovery plants uh, to, to, to promote this kind of ipsis between different, different member states. Uh, but the problem is that we, we, there is no strategy to, to bundle this with the use of new funding. Actually, the good thing would be to bundle also new funding to this uh, ipsis so that we can, as, as Jorge was saying, we can have a touch at the EU level to coordinate the ipsis. Otherwise, it will be on the national level uh, with the with the relaxation of the state aid rules at the EU level, but if there is there is a, is a risk that in the end the capacity to coordinate of EU actors will will be less important if we don't have funding to back it, this this coordination. So that that's maybe the, the challenge to uh, for the new uh, for the for the coming years how to use new funding not only to do things separately to the member states and not only to do things together through the partnerships within the Horizon Europe, which are very good, but uh, partnerships mainly on research and the early stages of innovation, but also in this logic of industrial support to value chains, which goes a bit beyond the pure uh, R and D and I uh, field, through this new form, uh, this new new team, which is the, the industrial the important project of uh, common European countries. And I will uh, stop here. <laughs> And uh, I am happy to hear the others and to, to, to participate with the questions and answers. Um, many thanks, Elalia. Um, for these really interesting points you made, useful contributions to the debate, and I think also your focus on Heading 1 complemented very nicely the point Mr. Van o Overvelt made about the contribution of EU budget, EU policies to the modernization of the EU economy. So that, that, that I think they worked very well together. Um, I'd just like to, at this point, uh, say to the audience, thank you for the questions that are coming in. Um, very good questions that we will put after our, our last two panelists have spoken. But and, and anybody who wants to ask a question, please don't hesitate to submit them and we will collect them all up and ask them um, at the end of this, this panel. Okay, so now we turn to our next panellist um, and there will be a shift in focus on some other parts of the e EU policy um, uh, universe. So we turn to Alessandro D'Alfonso, a policy analyst in the Members Research Service of the European Parliamentary Research Service. So Alessandro is a senior expert with many years experience in research on the EU budget and author of many highly regarded publications on a wide variety of issues related to the finances of the EU. His most recent work, or his more recent work, um, includes a focus on the challenges to the EU finances posed by uh, a number of emerging priorities, and in particular in the fields of climate change and border management and migration. So, Alessandro, could you tell us how does the MFF package respond to the challenges we're facing in the fields of, of climate action and border management and migration? Thank you, Fabia. Thank you all. Uh, indeed, uh, this is a, a very crucial question. Uh, as regards uh, climate action, uh, we all know that the fight against climate change is uh, one of the greatest challenges uh, of our times. And uh, this challenge uh, requires uh, a huge investment. Uh, citizens uh, increasingly perceive uh, um, the green transition as uh, a core mission of the European Union. Uh, it is uh, therefore essential for the EU budget uh, to be in line with and contribute to decarbonization efforts. Uh, the new MFF package uh, strengthens uh, the EU budget's contribution to decarbonization efforts in various ways. And uh, I would like to highlight uh, three of these uh, um, improvements. Uh, first, uh, we will have uh, um, additional allocations for climate relevant projects. Uh, 30% of uh, overall uh, MFF and NGU resources will finance uh, climate-relevant activities. 
So taking uh, the 2014, 2020 uh, MFF uh, as a reference point, uh, um, the new MFF uh, will increase by 31% the resources uh, uh, devoted to climate. Then if we had uh, the grants uh, under NGU, the resources will double. And uh, if we add further the loans on NGU, uh, we will have uh, 2.6 uh, times as many resources as uh, in uh, the previous MFF. This is uh, an increase uh, which is really significant. Uh, the second element uh, I would like to uh, highlight uh, is that uh, we will have uh, a new policy-specific uh, instrument, uh, the Just Transition Fund, which uh, will uh, finance uh, and uh, support uh, um, decarbonization efforts uh, in the regions and communities uh, most exposed to the costs of transition. And, uh, Mm, it was uh, the Parliament uh, that introduced in the MFF debate uh, uh, this uh, new instrument, uh, confirming uh, its um, holistic approach uh, to uh, green transition, um, meaning that uh, the green transition to be successful will have to take into due account uh, the environmental but also the economic and social dimensions of uh, uh, the challenge. Uh, as we have heard uh, um, from uh, Jorge, we need a recovery which is uh, inclusive and sustainable, that puts us on a more sustainable and stronger path um, for economic development. And uh, a third point, uh, um, is also the enhancement of uh, delivery tools. Um, we heard uh, from Anna that uh, uh, policy instruments uh, are being finalized uh, in the negotiations now. Um, of course, uh, resources are very important, uh, but uh, how we are going to um, incorporate uh, climate considerations and objectives uh, into um, all relevant uh, spending instruments uh, is equally important. And this is also in line with what Eulalia has just said, giving a sense of direction on some key missions for EU finances. And in this respect, uh, also uh, Parliament uh, secured uh, the strengthening of the climate mainstreaming methodology um, in order for the delivery to uh, improve uh, in effectiveness in the uh, new period. So we have a, a series of improvements, but will we face uh, uh, as well challenges? Uh, well, yes, we will, I think, because uh, as we have seen, uh, Next Generation EU uh, is um, going to play a major role in uh, uh, the boost to climate relevant uh, resources. But climate change is a long term challenge, while NGU is a temporary instrument. Uh, so uh, we will face a challenge once NGU is over and also in the next MFF uh, to maintain an appropriate level of funding for uh, the fight against climate change. And uh, in this respect, uh, the solution could be uh, the um, introduction of the new own resources uh, for the EU budget. Um, Parliament uh, uh, has strongly demanded uh, these uh, these resources could uh, contribute to the fight against climate change, um, not only providing uh, additional funding, but also uh, when linked to the climate action, um, contributing to policy objectives, um, such um, as uh, uh, um, resources such as the carbon border adjustment mechanism 
uh, or a resource linked to the emission trading system would go in this uh, direction. And uh, as I see uh, that uh, we are a bit short possibly on time, uh, I will uh, um, touch very briefly on uh, migration and border management. Uh, just to say that uh, these were also policy areas uh, that were identified as uh, needing uh, uh, more joint action and more resources uh, uh, during the preparations for the current MFF. What's the result uh, there? Um, we have as well uh, a significant increase in resources. Resources uh, will almost double there uh, during the uh, new period. Uh, however, uh, the Commission had requested uh, higher increases. Um, the European Council uh, uh, cut uh, part of these increases uh, and the uh, Parliament managed to uh, reverse uh, a part of these cuts. Um, we are also in different situation uh, as compared to uh, the Green Transition because for the Green Transition we had the European uh, Green Deal, a shared strategy. Um, for uh, migration and border management, uh, we have some agreements uh, on reform, for instance, the reinforcement of the European Border and Coast Guard Agency, and uh, additional resources uh, will accompany uh, this uh, reinforcement. But for other elements, uh, we do not have uh, an agreement yet. Uh, the new uh, Pact on Migration and Asylum was put forward by the Commission in September 2020, uh, which is after the European Council agreement on the new MFF. Uh, it remains to be seen whether uh, mm, overall resources in the MFF uh, will be enough, because uh, we had uh, a significant increase, but from a very low starting point. And so, uh, will this be enough to uh, tackle the financial implication of the new pact on asylum and migration? This uh, remains to be seen. And also, another challenge, uh, it's not only with how much, but also with how, a bit as I have mentioned for uh, climate action as well. Because uh, Indeed, uh, for instance, for the European Border and Coast Guard Agency, it will be a major endeavor to uh, increase uh, the organizational structure and have, uh, by 2027, a standing corps of uh, 10,000 uh, border guards. Uh, in recent years, uh, the agency has faced challenges in uh, filling vacant posts, so uh, these uh, will have to be monitored uh, closely. Thank you very much. Many thanks, um, Alessandro, um, for um, pointing out the issues in these particular areas. Um, I'm going to turn now very quickly to our last panelist, also from the Members Research Service of the European Parliamentary Research Service, we have um, Elena de Breva. Um, Elena has brought her work in the Budgetary Policies Unit of the EPRS, or to this work, a specialist knowledge in political communications, allowing her to build a bridge between research on the EU budget and public opinion research. So she's going to wrap up today's roundtable discussion with an overview of how the MFF package responds to citizens' expectations. So Alina, um, do you think that um, strategy and resources match citizens' expectations? How do you see that match? And what are the trends that you've seen in this analysis? The floor is yours. Thank you. 
As um, Ms. Jans was saying, it's a bit too early to say what the citizens uh, think and how they will evaluate uh, the current MFF and uh, NGU. But we can see what were the trends so far, how they saw the budget, so the EU budget so far, and try, of course, in our policy, uh, EU budget policy, try to avoid uh, consistent inconsistencies, to use the expression that Mr. Van Overveld uh, used previously. So what we're lucky that we don't need to guess the citizens' views on these matters. We have have a quite a rich uh, set of data from the Eurobarometer, from the standard Eurobarometer, that runs over a number of years and covers questions related to budget over a number of years. What we see is that relating to the size of the EU budget, we are on a very positive trend. And when citizens were asked if they support greater financial means for the EU, for the EU budget, then 48% of citizens in 2020 supported such statement. That means that is the highest number since this question was uh, introduced in the survey. Of course, we can end here and say, okay, we are on an excellent trend. We are uh, closing the gap between the expectations of citizens and what we deliver. But we need to go further, of course, and look uh, first in the uh, differences between member states. There are quite big discrepancies here. And the answers in this, uh, to this question in 2020 range from 69% in Portugal to 16% in Denmark, supporting uh, bigger financial means for the EU. So we need to look at this uh, on country level as well as on EU level in order to understand if there is a match or there is a gap between the strategy and resources and expectations of citizens. One very common um, frame that tries to explain this mismatch on uh, member state level is the um, frame of net balances or net beneficiaries and net contributors to the EU budget will have quite different or opposing opinions on that. However, when we see uh, the data on citizens level rather than uh, the political discussion and the political debates, we see that this frame does not explain the whole difference between the opinions of citizens. In this question as well, but on other questions that I will further discuss, even less this is the explanatory frame. So we really need to look at the citizens as individuals rather than re just representing member states in order to see whether there is a match with their expectations. Uh, another set of questions that was asked by Eurobarometer and I said set because there are two questions that are mirroring each other. One is what the EU citizens think that the EU budget is spent on. And the other one is what the EU citizens would like the EU budget to be spent on. And of course, we have different pictures there. And it's interesting to see the gap between the pictures that uh, these two questions draw. On the desire side, we see that uh, citizens overwhelmingly across the Union put as the top desired priority for EU spending, the employment, social affairs and public health long before COVID appeared on the horizon. That was a priority for citizens ever since this question was asked first in 2008. So there is a consistency, even in one of the years, it was all across all the member states that was the top priority for all member states. So we that's uncontested leader on the desire side. One um, other category that I will mention is the climate change uh, that shows significant growth. It was an issue for certain member states, now it's growing support across the Union and looking at the data we can see, we can safely bet that this will be a growing demand and growing expectations from the citizens to have increasing EU spending in this area. On the, I'm not going to go through all the areas, we don't have time for that. But uh, as I saw, my paper is already linked in the chat, you can look at that. 
On the perception question, the top perceived priority for EU spending is completely different. One, it's administration. Citizens perceive that EU spends most of its money on EU administration. There is obviously, for I guess, all the participants and all, everyone in this uh, on this event, that they understand that there is uh, a gap here, perception gap or reality gap to call it, that that perception of EU citizens simply doesn't respond, correspond to the reality. However, we need to take this into account very seriously and address this as a communication challenge and see what we can do about that. Because this is a consistent um, myth that is that continues um, running throughout the years. Now is a little bit on the decline, we see, but it still persists very much and we need to address it as a serious challenge, not just smile. Although, yeah, it's it's very far from the truth, as we very well know, but we need to address it very seriously. So I prepared one slide that maybe you will see in a moment that you can see the gap between these perceptions and and desires of you citizens. You see the and here. Uh, on the uh, two points of time, 2008 and 2020. But as you can see here, probably the first thing you see is the gaps are not very big, which is already a good news that what citizens perceive as spending in EU and what they would like the EU spending to be in most areas is very close to each other. So the gaps are not big. However, there are a um, few areas in which the gaps are quite big. One is the already mentioned administration, and uh, you see it on the top of this graph. And here you see that there is what I call the overspending perception gap. Citizens think that it's we spend much more, you spend much more than they desire. So, but the direction of the gap is not only in this direction. If you look a bit further down this list, you see this employment, social affairs and public health, which, which shows even bigger gap, but in the exactly opposite direction. Citizens perceive EU spending considerably less than they would like to see spending. Of course, here we also can talk about communicating what the EU is spending and how it does, but we also need to look at this gap from the policy perspective, if that needs to be addressed uh, from the policy point of view. One gap that shows growth, although it's, it's a bit hard to see on the graph, is, is climate change and environmental protection, a bit lower than the middle of the of the graph you see that there we have um the perception of how much you spend is growing but the desire of how much EU citizens want the EU to spend is growing much more than than the perception and therefore the gap grows either the, the, here we can say that EU needs to catch up to the citizens to the citizens desires in this respect so one conclusion that i will draw here from this uh, from this graph is that it's not sufficient to look at the budget and the match of strategy and resources just on the overall level of eu budget but we thoroughly need to look at each area of spending at each policy area because they show quite diverse pictures quite different pictures and some are overspending, some are not. But yet we also need to look at country level. And if we can see the second slide, I'm not going to go through all uh, member states, of course, but just to show you as a glimpse, an idea of what I'm talking about. In the first two graphs, you see um, employment and social affairs uh, policy area and administration policy area, in which you can see that all the desires in employment, all the, the all lines of preference for um, 
EU spending in all member states are way above all perceptions in all member states of what the EU spends. Completely the opposite we see in the second graph where we see uh, the perception and the desires regarding the administrative spending. So here we see uh, very clearly that the direction in which communication and policy changes needs to go in terms of uh, budgetary spending and communicating how we do budgetary spending. However, there are policy areas like agriculture and rural development, which on the previous graph didn't show big, big uh, gap between desires and perception. But when we look here in the in, on the member states level, we see that there is quite a diverse picture of the desires and perceptions in the member states. According to citizens in some member states, there is a overspending. According to citizens in other member states, there is a underspending. We really need to address this policy area also on member states level and I would say on citizens level in order to understand the gaps between the perception and desire and to see what is the most efficient way to address them because obviously they cannot be with one tool will work uh, will be able to close the gap for everyone on the contrary, even just mechanical closing of the gap can lead to more disparity in the opinions of the member states. So um, I will probably close here. And if there are questions on the future uh, potential for closing the gap and uh, how we deal with that, I can answer later. But I think that we still need to give the floor to the to. Uh, all other participants for questions and answers. Thank you. Many thanks, Alina. Um, and thanks to all the panellists. That rounds off our, our, our collection of interventions. Um, I'd like to thank the audience for active participation um, and the interesting questions that have been submitted. I will, um, we have a number, I'll try and sum up as best as I can. I will ask the questions and I'll ask you to answer in turn um, in the same order in which you spoke. So um, we have some questions, first of all, from Magdalena Sapala, who asked first about the strategy. So we've spoken about how the extent to which the MFF responds to individual, certain strategies. The question is, should we have one overall strategy like we used to have for example the Lisbon strategy or Europe 2020. Um, a second question was on on the NGU some of you have spoken about some some issues with the N NGU and the question is if not the NGU then what can you imagine something better and then Magdalena's final question is on um, involvement of EU citizens in the um, decisions about the EU finances and whether it, um, it that should be taken account of, for example, through a plebiscite or referendum. That's one set of questions. Then we have some a few more specific questions, one from Marco Fusaro, and this one is um, addressed to um, Hannah Jans, and it's about the um, NGU and um, really a it's quite a long question, but but the essence of it is that it's it's not gone as quickly as we would have hoped because of the various procedural blockages. So the question is, is there anything that could be done to avoid this kind of the, these procedural burden in future? Is there any margin of manoeuvre to modify the way we do this in future in order to guarantee the EU the financial means it needs to act quickly? And, 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 and finally, what about the possibility of rendering the NGEU a permanent instrument? And then the last question I'll ask in this round is from um, Marina Solo Garcia, who has a question about InvestEU, how it's calculated and how much money is there for it in the MFF, and a request to explain a little bit more about the EU guarantee. I think I'll stop now because we're almost out of time. I would ask the, I would ask the panelists to respond in one minute uh, um, to these uh, this very <laughs> rich uh, menu of questions, starting with Hannah, please. 
Yes, thank you very much, and many thanks for 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 interesting um, panel uh, discussions, uh, comments, uh, interventions. I will be very brief because indeed I actually am under pressure because I'm getting vaccinated in 15 minutes. So um, wanted to say to Magdalena that um, well. The other option, if not NGO, then what? It would be, of course, to have a bigger budget under MFF. We all know that this was rather a difficult uh, exercise to um, to manage. And we, we all knew in March that we have to come up with something better than um, just to ask member states to contribute more. So I think um, this was this this was an option that was considered um, as, as the only possible to top up, of course, significantly. And we needed the big number. So, so in my view, um, um, and it links to the question whether it can stay permanent, um, NGO as such and borrowing as such, or, or, or uh, this exercise can stay permanent, obviously, but not under this article in the treaty, because for this particular exercise, we have used the uh, article that that clearly talks about um, uh, emergency situations uh, of unprecedented nature. Um, on the foresight, uh, yes, I think that's uh, planned uh, in general to have a more, more link. But of course, we are also uh, victims of political uh, agendas and calendars. And as you may imagine, uh, all uh, different elements of how the budget is constructed have a certain political uh, dimension. Also, when the parliamentary um, um, uh, elections are happening, but also when the national elections are happening. And foresight is a very good uh, um, tool, of course, and should be linked, and but should be linked to it, or vice versa. But sometimes this is, um, well, how shall I put it, uh, defeating the purpose, uh, because at the end of the day, uh, the politics prevails, um, which is, of course, uh, not something that we all hear in this panel want mm, on the on the blockages um, and the margins and the qu act quickly a question i actually think that we were not that bad i just wanted to recall that ord decisions decision last time ratification uh, was in 2015ish i think it took 2 years to ratify uh, it's the fourth month we are ratifying the and it 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 has to be that way because we are securing the the borrowing uh, through 311 um so the there must be a headroom and this headroom had, has to be ratified by all member states in order for us then to really um, deliver um the money um uh, the rest we are ready to borrow and um, we have produced the ngu strategy it has been published on the 14th of april we have all the necessary elements. We have uh, put together a um, uh, debt management office uh, uh, in the Commission. So we are ready to borrow. We just need the ratification to be finalized and then the plans to be adopted. And this, as you may imagine, is another long discussion, which I'm sure we will continue because my last word is to invite you all uh, to the ABC, so annual budget conference uh, that we are uh, reconvening this year on the 8th of November. Uh, where we will talk a lot about um, how indeed uh, budget is uh, budgetary policy is changing and how it impacts the economy and uh, and the citizens and and our first experience on N NGU borrowing will be also a subject of this co this conference and I apologize that I need to cut short uh, but you will all understand that this is a rather important um, appointment thank you very much thank you. Many thanks, Hannah, and thanks for participating in this event. And yeah, good luck with your vaccination. A good example to highlight your talk. <laughs> um, Jorge, could you please um, tackle the questions um, that we've received from the audience in one minute? Thank you. I will try my best. Uh, first of all, in, on the uh, on what kind of funding the EU should have on the, the system if there is no NGO or something else, this answers several of these questions. But we do not have a, a proper response in the budget. The budget is built for uh, in, investment. It's, it's not a reaction budget. It's not a proper budget for uh, handling, like, let's say, government. Uh, it doesn't have the flexibility. And uh, it has always been refused by the Council to have even a kind of emergency fund inside it, because also the legal structure and the rules and the treaties and the financial regulations. So we don't have 
really something to react fast, to have funds ready. And there was the borrowing that is not really possible unless you use this article that we're using here of assigned revenue, which is not perfect at all, not even for this COVID response. It's really pulled uh, to the limit. Uh, so it would be necessary to uh, change that uh, so that we have something that is approaching more and more to what a currency union needs with a single market, which we don't have. And this is uh, what we're speaking about, transfer union. And uh, this has been known since the 70s that one day this would somehow crack if we don't have something. And it's what's happening. That's why InvestEU was created, the Juncker plan, uh, now next generation you these are all symptoms of a kind of uh, disease that we have on the structure of the eu that is not built for for this kind of things um and uh, i think madalena was asking about strategy um and i have to say that yeah we do have one it's called the green deal is the is the future is the next of the uh, lisbon and the europe 2020 it's just that it's much bigger than and other things it goes beyond and it has a lot of other things so it's not so clear but it is certainly the strategy behind now if it should have another name or if it's more uh, if you need something more concise that's another story but it does give uh, the eu let's say a direction uh, so uh, I, I'm really against about this thing about referendum on the budget unless citizens understood much better what the budget is as we have seen at the graphs they don't so uh, if there is no way to teach a bit better what the European Union actually does and how it actually works, I don't see how they can vote. And I'm not very sure that referendums have shown us fantastic results. So I would uh, really prefer not to play with that. We have a representative democracy for a reason. And I don't go to my neighbor to know if I have to have an operation, I will go to a doctor. And this is the point is about here, is someone responsible to actually understand things so that they can take a decision. And the question here is how to make governments better or governance better. I'm a bit worried about referendums. Uh, there is just a last thing. I don't think we can describe here the InvestEU. It's a bit complex uh, and guarantees. I don't think it's the place. Uh, there are ways to find information. I, I really think that uh, that using this uh, is difficult to explain here. I would avoid that. What I would just going to say is that there is a question about InvestEU and guarantees and so on, the sense that we are we created an enormous lending facility and we are in the next generation EU and at the end you have uh, these other guarantees and lending facilities, which is EIBs uh, and, and promotional banks and so on. The question here is we I still don't understand very well um, how, how these things will interplay. So there is a question there. Uh, that's it. Acting quickly was the last thing. Permanent instrument. I said it before about the we need a different effectively. We need a European Union able to have the space inside to have a reaction capacity when something happens is necessary in a single market, single currency. We can never also guarantee that this crisis that we have now, that the next one will not come while well, this one is still not finished. So we have to be ready all the time that things don't go like we want. We had the migration, the financial crisis, the migration crisis, the climate crisis, COVID crisis. I don't know what the next one is. Spacemen arriving and invading us, given the, uh, the, that we had a pandemic that nobody expected. So we have to have something that is ready. And so I will stop here and it's more than one minute, sorry. Thanks, Jorge. No, well, there were so many questions. I, I, I'm not surprised it took you a bit longer. But anyway, Olalio, um, over to you, please. Your thoughts yeah, on these questions. Yeah, we try to restrain to one minute and not, then not answering all the questions. Just two, two, two words on NGU permanent. I think we, we cannot know now. That depends on many things, on how it works. And what, what we can't retain is that we know that we have this type of instrument and we can put into place this type of instrument in case of crisis. We don't know if this one will render will be rendered permanent. And then what is clear to me, and it is absolutely clear, is that that's going to change the EU budget. That's for sure. I mean, NGU will have some impact on the way we organize the budget. For instance, cohesion policy for me will never be the same after the NGU. We will there will be there will be uh, there will be experiences. There will be lessons wrong from from the use of investment versus reform that will change the next the next generation of cohesion policies. And then on invest you find as, as what I say it's a bit complex, but maybe just saying that one thing is the allocation, the budgetary allocation, the other thing is the guarantee that we give with invest you fund. Uh, we are now at nine billions more or less of um, of budgetary allocations for invest you fund. 
but uh, the, the guarantee will be bigger because this guarantee is only 40% provision. So these 9 billion serve to provision a guarantee that is bigger. We, we don't provision all the guarantee because, well, we, because the EU actors um, consider that, uh, well, the risk are not so high and they, they, they estimate the risk so that we can, uh, we can cover the losses with just 40% of the, of the guarantee covered. And that's why the impact or the capacity to, you know, the, yeah, the, the capacity to invest will be bigger, will be around 20 something. But it is still less than what was proposed at the beginning, which was around 30 something. So just, just, I, I, I stop here because it's late. I think people is a bit tired. <laughs> Uh, thanks, Alalia. You managed a minute. Alessandro, please, your thoughts. Thank you, Fabia. Uh, luckily, uh, the other speakers have already said uh, many insightful uh, things on uh, uh, all the questions. Uh, uh, I would like just to say that uh, I agree with uh, Jorge. We had the uh, European Green Deal uh, as uh, the growth strategy of the European Union. Of course, uh, we need uh, a common strategy for, uh, in a sense of direction also for the EU budget. And the uh, Green Deal uh, uh, will play this role uh, in the years to come. Uh, of course, uh, the EU budget then uh, will have to tackle also other uh, treaty obligations, uh, but a sense of uh, shared direction is uh, absolutely needed. And um, I agree with Jorge also on the fact that uh, uh, a referendum would not be appropriate to uh, decide how to spend uh, the budget. Um, for migration and border management, for instance, uh, Eurobarometer uh, surveys show that uh, before the refugee crisis of 2015-2016, uh, citizens did not expect uh, the EU budget to intervene that much in that area. But when uh, we had the uh, crisis, uh, expectation uh, increased uh, quite significantly. And so uh, it's not because uh, uh, citizens had not uh, planned or uh, foreseen that uh, this would be needed, that uh, we should not uh, plan in advance. Uh, and for InvestEU, um, I um, will send uh, a link uh, to uh, the EPS briefing uh, on this, uh, if uh, this can be of help. Thank you. Many thanks, Alessandro. So finally, we, we get the floor to Alina. And there's an, if you want to tackle any of the questions asked, fine. But there's an, a, an additional question specifically for you, Alina, from Elena Lazaru, who asks, do we have any way of correlating the data to the level of citizens' understanding of how the EU budget works and correlating that to their expectations about national government spending? Are they similar? Please, Alina. Thank you. I'll start with uh, bringing citizens to the table and uh, for the EU budget as a whole, and I will uh, contradict a bit what Jorge and Alessandro were saying. But on, on the whether we need referendums, I would agree, um, because the thing is that democracy is about informed choices. And we very often dismiss this par first part of informed. And I would be a strong defender that we need to bring a citizens' evaluations, expectations uh, to the table when we tackle and when we do any programming, planning and reforms related to EU budget. We need to address what citizens think, but we need to make citizens feel that their voices are heard. But we also, at the same level or even stronger efforts should be made to inform the citizens about the EU budget. Of course, EU budget is not something that everyone is very interested in and everyone goes uh, in depth to understand it. 
but we need to also address this issue from the perspective of why there are difficulties of understanding the EU budget. And here we're talking not only about communicators doing this job of informing citizens, but also policymakers need to uh, take their responsibility for that. And I will tell you that it's not all like, oh, budget is too complicated and that's it, full stop. There are ways of addressing these things and I will give an, uh, examples, uh, positive current examples. The reform of own resources, that brings much more transparency to the table and makes it much easier for citizens to understand the link between them and the EU budget. Also, the performance budgeting, that also makes it more transparent to the citizens and bringing it closer to their understanding and to their interest. So there should be more emphasis in this respect in order to increase the support and by that also the legitimacy of the whole EU budget. On the question of um, Elena Lazaro, I would say that so far I haven't tackled uh, in detail this, uh, this issue, but there are ways of uh, doing that and I think that in the future we will need to do much more research in this respect because we see that increasingly the importance of pan-European problems is things that are things that EU citizens want to be addressed. The European public sphere is in, of increasing importance and national level explanations just don't work anymore as they used to in the past. Not that in the past they explained everything, but now even less. So I think that there needs to be much more research in this respect. There are ways to do it and I think that it will be useful for any policy maker of the future. Thank you. Many thanks, Alina, and big, big thanks to all the speakers at today's event and to the audience. Um, been very great. Um, can I just remind everyone that this event has been recorded and will be made available shortly on the EPRS YouTube channel. Um, information about a number of relevant publications has been provided during the event through the chat function. Um, and you can also find some information on relevant publications on the uh, EPRS events uh, page on our website. I'm going to pass the floor now back to Etienne um, to close this event. Thanks everyone, goodbye. Thank you very much Fabia and uh, many thanks also to all the speakers and the listeners that are quite a large number at this uh, late uh, hour. I don't need to mention the publications of the EPRS, they have been mentioned by Alessandro and Fabia. Uh, I'd just like to uh, flag that we will have next week another event that is relating to citizens' expectation. It's a presentation on Tuesday next week by uh, Juan Fernando López Aguila, the chair of our Civil Liberties Committee, on his book on this subject. And it will be in conversation with Enrique Baron Crespo and Richard Corbett. I encourage you to register for that event. Uh, but before that, we will have another event, I would say a, a joyful event, which will be about uh, the Ode to Joy from the musical masterpiece into an anthem and it will be an event uh, later this week on Thursday and that will be um, introduced by uh, the chair of our culture, uh, culture and education uh, uh, committee, uh, Mrs. Uh, Verheyen. So I encourage you also to register and to follow that event. Many thanks to all of you. Uh, have a good day. See you soon. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Bye. 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 Thanks. <laughs>